Hello, and good morning. This is Chris Jones with the University of Arizona, Gila County Cooperative Extension. And we are here for our next edition of the Pacing Community Garden uh, Spring Training Classes or Spring cl Gardening Classes. And today we're really excited to have with us Jane Crafter and Sandra Ayer to talk about tomatoes galore. I know we're all here for this. Um, just a little bit about these uh, webinars. They are a weekly webinar series. I make them uh, 60 minutes or less. They're Thursday mornings at 11 a.m. in Arizona. Since February 11 and to today, I've been hosting the spring gardening classes for the Payson Community Garden in Northern Gila County, Arizona. So this kind of completes the session that we've had, but we may continue to do some more uh, of these um, gardening classes from the Payson Community Garden through the summer. I know we have one about microbes and mulch um, at the first week of May. So we'll come back for that. All of the recordings are posted at the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. So if you get that up and you look up for uh, Garden and Country, you'll find these recordings. They also end up at the Payson Community Gardens website. So try to make these available when we're done. And the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. So here's our program today, Tomatoes Galore. Um, thank you for everybody who logged in or early, call it kind of the lag time, make sure everything works. Uh, welcome, I'm Chris Jones, your moderator. Our topic today is Tomatoes Galore with Jane Crafter and Sandra Ayer. They have a video and some discussion and PowerPoints, you know, mixed media today. So we're, we're doing it all. We will have an opportunity for a chat box discussion with Jane and Sandra when we're done. And at noon, we'll finish up the uh, call and, and, and answer any more questions after that. So here is Jane and Sandra. And they're just as lovely here on our cameras as they are in that picture there at the Desert Garden, I understand, Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix. And um, they are Payson Community Gardeners. They, they joined the garden just last year, spring of 2019, and wanting to produce particularly tomatoes. And they attended all of these classes last year and learned all about it and how to gardening and how to do gardens um, and tomatoes and gardening in general. Jane is from Australia and had no experience in vegetable gardening, but raised a collection of 200 orchards when she lived in Florida. And Sandra grew up in Indiana and raised tomatoes as a youngster during the summer in, her, at, in the family garden. So they got lucky and were assigned a plot amongst some amazing master gardeners. Jane and Sandy showed up almost every day in the garden and weren't too proud to ask questions or ask for help when needed. And all that work paid off in both years, they've had wonderful crops of tomatoes. So welcome. And so one thing I enjoy about giving presentations like this is you're gardeners, everybody listening here is a gardener. And so you speak the same language. So when you start talking about tomatoes, they understand. So how are you doing today? Well, we're doing really well. We're uh, excited to, uh, this is our second presentation. Uh, we gave one uh, on Zoom to just the Pace and Community Gardeners last year, and uh, evidently we did okay. Yes, and to prepare for the day, uh, we had BLTs for dinner last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good deal. Well, go ahead and um, bring up your screen, and we'll jump right in. Okay, ready to go? We're ready yes, to go. As, uh, Right. As Chris said, I'm Sandy or Sandra, one, uh, I go by both names. And, and I'm Jane. So as Chris said, we're, uh, we have a plot in the garden, E4. And what we want to share with you today is basically what we learned those first two years in the garden, which were 2019 and 2020. And because we're now in our, our third year. And I'm going to be speaking about tomatoes and Jane who's from Australia will be speaking about tomatoes and yes I am from Australia from Adelaide Australia and I've uh, been in the U.S. since 1981 but I really had no experience growing up uh, you know growing tomatoes at all but I sure did enjoy eating them 
my favorite thing in the world was just fresh bread that the baker delivered with lots of fresh tomatoes, vine ripened tomatoes on it. And Sandy, who grew up in Indiana, as you said, Chris, um, her mom, uh, she watched her mom and helped her mom grow and, uh, uh, you know, harvest the tomatoes in the family plot. And it was a great summer crop and she's really enjoyed them. We didn't have any experience, uh, you know, growing tomatoes or even uh, vegetable gardening at all, but we really threw ourselves into it and we were determined to get a good crop uh, of all vegetables, but we were really looking forward to having vine ripened tomatoes. As you said also, Chris, we did uh, attend all the classes, the in-person ones in 2019, and then the Zoom ones uh, as well in 2020 due to the pandemic. And we just tried to soak up as much information as we could. We showed up every day to our garden. I mean, every now and again, we'd miss a few days, but we really wanted to make sure that we, we tended our garden and we didn't neglect it at all. We did get lucky. Um, Leo assigned us a plot that happened to be right next to his. Uh, E4 is our plot and uh, we've been surrounded by some terrific uh, gardeners and we've, we've really enjoyed uh, our location. Right, and as um, Jane said, um, you know, we were amongst many of the gardeners and the master gardeners and asked many questions. We asked so many questions in 2019, 2020, and here's 2021, we're still asking them. But we asked so many questions, we really were afraid that one year they wouldn't ask us back, but here we are in our third <laughs> year, so I guess not too bad. Um, and one of the things that we weren't too proud to let people know we didn't know something or to ask questions and everybody was so helpful and no question was a bad question. And um, we learned a lot. And we, we, when we were um, given some advice, we actually took it and um, it helped tremendously. We're not experts or don't claim to be experts with tomatoes, but we did learn a lot. And that's what we're wanting to share with you today the first two years that we were in the garden, really everything that we learned. Hopefully for a new time gar gardener, it will be helpful. And maybe even some of those people who have been gardeners for a long time, they can pick up a few tips. So we're thinking, Chris, uh, if we can uh, just stop our video and then go on to the next slide, would that be okay? You can, um, you, you can advance the slide. So go ahead and use your okay. mouse to go to the next slide. Okay, can we uh, pause our, our video up here? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll stop our video. There you go. Done. All there right, perfect, perfect. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So let's start with uh, the basics uh, of tomatoes. Tomatoes are divided into two kinds, uh, indeterminate and determinate. So firstly, the indeterminates are vining tomatoes. Um, and their growth is extended throughout the season until really the first frost sets in in autumn. The fruit sets and ripens throughout the season slowly and steadily, but they will need large caging or staking as they can grow anywhere uh, from six to 10 feet. The most common crop of tomatoes are found in this indeterminate category, including most heirlooms and cherry tomatoes. Now the determinates are more of a bush tomato they don't grow as tall as the indeterminates, usually about four to five feet. But the difference is they will ripen all of their fruit in a very short period of time, usually over a couple of weeks. And they will also need sturdy caging and staking as well because they have a heavy load of fruit. They do stop growing in height once all their fruit is set. Now let's go on to heirloom tomatoes. Heirlooms are generally considered to be a variety that the seeds have been passed down from season to season through several generations of families or communities because of the valued characteristics. All heirlooms are open pollinated, meaning that they're pollinated naturally by birds, insects or wind and not genetically modified at all. But the difficulty is they may not be as disease or insect resistant or even as well adapted to our climate. But their colors, flavors, textures and shapes vary from species to species. They may not be as abundant a crop as hybrids either, but they are usually very delicious. Now the hybrid tomatoes are produced by intentionally crossing pollen of different varieties of tomatoes. So this means that the child will have the characteristics of both of the parent plants. Consequently, they can be bred to be more hardy, more resistant to disease and insects, and many are bred to be quite heat resistant 
and do very well up here in Payson. Now in this slide, you can see an illustration of an indeterminate versus a determinate. It clearly shows the density of tomatoes on the determinate plant. And you can also see the difference in height and how the determinate on the right will have all of its fruit ripen in a very short period of time. Aroma tomato is a good example of a determinate. Now, usually the plant nursery label will specify which category your plant will be. So do read it, save it and pay attention as this will affect your caging needs. Now let's go on to the next slide. And these are some of our favorite tomatoes that we have grown. In our first year in 2019 in the garden, we planted a couple of heirloom tomatoes, but sadly one didn't make it. We then realized that heirloom tomatoes were not quite as resilient as the hybrids in our climate. But the one that did survive, a pink brandy wine, we nicknamed it the tomato tree, was a huge plant, but sadly it bore us only five fruit, but they were huge. So now we mostly prefer hybrid varieties such as the ones listed here. Now, these are some of the photos that I found of our particularly favorite tomatoes. The beefsteak, and this goes from left to right. The beefsteak is a large, meaty, great slicing and sandwich tomato. It matures late, but is very disease resistant and will need a very large cage as it is an indeterminate. The big boy next to it is an indeterminate as well that will produce a lot of great tasting large fruit and it's very resistant to cracking too. Now cracking occurs uh, when you get a lot of moisture, a lot of rain, and then all of a sudden a lot of sun, the tomatoes can crack. They will still taste good, uh, but they don't look as attractive. But this is a variety uh, that resists cracking. It's an excellent sandwich slicer or excellent also in a caprese salad. It will require a large cage and staking too. The one next to it is a lemon boy, mild with low acidity, it is also a great tasting tomato that grows tall and is very disease resistant. It gives visual interest in your garden. As you can see, it is a yellow tomato, but pay attention to when it ripens. Uh, as it ripens, it does start to get uh, a slightly darker gold color. Beautiful tomato. The one next to it, a yellow pear cherry. We actually didn't grow this one in the garden last year. But Carol Noble, one of our staff members did, and she was kind enough to let us come over and snack on its fruit uh, whenever we wanted. And it is sweet and delicious. We are gonna grow this one this year. It's very prolific, excellent in salads. And even though the fruit is small, the plant is large as it is an indeterminate and it will need uh, a very sturdy cage. Now, the one on the lower left is Celebrity. That's a medium large tomato, great flavor. It's also very prolific and disease resistant. It grows to about four to five feet, but it's kind of a semi-determinate and it does bear its fruit all season. Uh, it will bear a heavy, heavy load of tomatoes, so it will need a sturdy cage. Uh, it's an excellent tomato, very uh, popular uh, with the gardeners here in the Payson Community Garden. The one on the, uh, the lower right is called Somerset. Now this one is bred to be very heat resistant and that does great in our midsummer heat up here in Payson. It's a semi-determinate, but it bears its load of large globe-shaped fruit in a short space of time, but it grows to about four to six feet. And I'm uh, pretty much repeating this, it will need sturdy caging. It has a firm, juicy texture and sweet flavor and is great for sandwiches. So now let's head out to the Payson Community Garden Plot where Sandy will guide you through the finer points of planting and watering to tomatoes. But I must, uh, ask you to put your volume up as far as it can. It was a really, really windy day as it is often in spring uh, and you may hear quite a bit of uh, wind noise. Thank you Over very you, much. Chris. Thank you very much. I'm just going to go ahead. I, hopefully, am I sharing the screen? Let's make sure I share the screen. Share sound. And just let me know this. Yep. Hi, I'm Sandy Herr and I'm coming to you from the Payson Community Garden. This is our garden plot, E4. I have it, uh, share it with Jane Crafter. And today I'm going to talk to you about planting tomatoes, other tomato techniques, uh, tomato cages, and also setting up a watering system for your tomato plants. One of the first things that you have to think about when you go to uh, purchase a tomato plant or you know, even think about planting tomatoes 
is are you going to plant from seed or are you going to plant from a plant? I always plant from a plant, but there are many people in the garden who plant from seeds that they've grown at home, maybe each season they've you know kept those seeds and they plant them at home and they get seeds and they bring them into the garden. But I purchase mine from a nursery and when you go to purchase a tomato plant, don't get the largest one because if you do, you've already purchased one that maybe even has blooms on it and um, it's already starting to, to grow and it's not even necessarily going to be ready to set up a really good root system. So get a smaller one. So the one I purchased here is an early girl, which those are typically ones that when you plant early in the garden, they don't take as long you know, to produce tomatoes. And the first thing I need to do, I've already pre-dug a hole that I've uh, made sure for when I fill it in. I want to get it basically up to here. Now I am going to cut off some of the branches that come out from the tomato plant. Because what happens is you want to make sure that you don't have any branches touching the ground. You want to make sure that you have a nice stem coming up and that will produce a good root system. So I'm going to trim those up now. Sometimes people will just pinch them off. I want to try my new here and I'll just take those off, go to here, and also if you see any suckers on, suckers are, are those, uh, you know, uh, stems that start, uh, growths that start to come from between like a Y in your plant, you cut those off too, but I've now cut off all the growths and I'm going to plant up to about here. So the first thing I want to do before I do that is, many of you have already heard from the other presentations about Glenn's Mix. It's a fertilizer mix. And if you want to know how to make it, in the garden they do have um, uh, a sheet that will give you the specifications. Or just go to Plant Fair Nursery and say you want to get all the components for Glenn's Mix. So I'm just going to put a little bit in here first. Okay? And then I want to cover it with some soil. I want to kind of get a little bit, give it a little water and get some, and get it really penetrating. So now that we've done that, let's play a plant to see how it looks. It looks a little bit different than when we first purchased it. Again, this is an early girl. So. and 
keep it down around your plant. Kind of mix some of that in. And again, we've watered it. We're going to have plant six tomatoes. Try to avoid getting it on the leaves. We're going to have six tomato plants in the garden this year. We typically have nine. We're going to go with six. And now I have my first one done. Another thing that I really want to add here is with the tomato plants, I think that um, sometimes you'll see in a garden, you'll see marigolds or basil planted around tomato plants. Those are called companion plants. What they do is they help deter insects from attacking the tomato plant. For some reason, those plants have an odor or taste. So whatever insects might attack your tomato plants, don't like the marigold or the basil, and there's other companion plants out there you can use too. So, um, they, they stay away from your tomato plants. It seems to work because we haven't had that many problems. So, so what you do is just, you know, just amongst your different tomato plants, just put in basil and marigolds. The marigolds look beautiful in your garden, and also the basil you can use. So that's another thing that we do as a companion plant. And uh, when you do go to plant, Probably the biggest question you're going to have is when do you plant? When you plant is the most critical because the temperature should be uh, in, in the 60s. At night it shouldn't be dropping below 50 and they say the ideal temperature is 70 and 80s for tomato plants. Tomato plants are warm weather plants. So you even can test the soil and you want the soil if you have a thermometer just to see if um, it's at 50 degrees. Now I did read somewhere too that I thought um, I was going to tell some of the gardeners about this and see if I see people doing it. They say that if you take your finger and you just stick it into the soil as far down as you can and you time it for a minute, if within a minute it's getting too cold and you want to take your finger out, don't plant any tomato plants. How's that? It's probably going to be a problem because the biggest you know, fear that you have of a tomato plant is frost. They also say that Mother's Day is probably the typical guideline you use for when to plant. So the best thing I can suggest, look at what the weather's going to be. If you see a frost is coming, don't plant. Uh, you know, just, just wait until maybe that subsides. But let's say you do plant and oh my gosh, a frost is coming. Let me tell you about something that I've seen a lot of in the garden lately. It's called walls of water. Let me move this out of the way. And what they are, it's basically plastic, you know, pieces of plastic with like tubes inside. And what you do is you fill up the tubes and you place these around your, the plant that you just planted. And that insulates because during the day, the, the heat of the sun insulates or really heats up the water and it insulates, provides an insulation for the plant. And if you know that a frost is coming, then just cover up, you know, bring those together, tie them together, or put a frost bus over the top. So basically, if you're going to go um, use the walls of water, you might want to look at who has them, say, hey, how'd you do that? But it's easy. Maybe put the walls of water in a five-gallon bucket and start filling up a little bit of each of the tubes. Place them over your plant and then fill up the rest. And make sure you stake it. Otherwise, those those will just fall right into, you know, they'll fall right in. And that you don't want to have. Um, as far as planting too, one thing to remember is you plant 24 inches apart at the very least. Uh, tomato plants need a lot of room to grow and they need that air flow. So when you do that, you know, you're really giving them room to grow. If it can be more than 24 inches, that's fine. Um, so basically, that's, you know, you know a big, good summary of planting tomato plant and the walls of water. And next we will go to cages. Now we're going to talk about tomato cages. What you see here is a 42 inch tomato cage, which is the most popular one you'll find out there, whether you're online or you go to any of the nursery or go to Home Depot, you'll find these. They aren't as sturdy as what you might need, especially if you have an indeterminate tomato plant which grows and grows. 
this probably isn't going to be sturdy enough to help with that. Uh, but all the, even if you use these for a determinant one, you're going to need to stake it with either wooden stakes or metal stakes because um, you're going to get a lot of growth in your tomatoes. And there's been, I mean, if you walk through the garden, you will see some very healthy, large tomato plants. So this is 42 inch. There's actually tomato cages like this that are 54 inch. You can sometimes find them. And they, look how much taller they are. They will really, you know, probably handle, especially your determinate ones and some indeterminate. But you're going to have to stake these two. So this is the most popular that I'm starting to see in the garden. And these, uh, you will not find them sold anywhere. You need to make them. These are made up of uh, wire remesh, or, or sheets that are used construction projects with uh, concrete when they're laying concrete. And if you go to Home Depot, you go down the construction aisle, it's actually the last aisle, it's right by the restrooms, and you turn around and you go, okay, there's all these sheets. They're 42 inch by 7 feet, and you roll them until you get a diameter of about 22, 23 inches. Um, and you can uh, tie them together with zip ties, hog bolts, um, heavy wire, whatever will hold these together. So it's almost a two-person project to do it. And then you've got this. Then you have to set it up about 10 to 12 inches off the ground and attach them to some steel stakes. And you've got, if you can see, it pretty sturdy. And I put this on top. This is actually something I had laying around at home. This wrap, I think, pipe into insulation. You've got a lot of sticky things and stuff, you know, that can come out from here. And some people put noodles, you know, swimming pool noodles you can get at the dollar store to cover some of it to keep you from uh, getting, you know, really scraped by some of this stuff. And it does end up rusting, but, you know, that's okay. It works so well. The thing is, these are six by six inch holes. You can easily reach in to pick your tomatoes. As you need them, and this gives a lot of room for the tomatoes to grow. So this is again one that you'll see a lot of in the garden and works really well, especially for those indeterminate tomatoes. Because one year we had we had what was a tomato tree our first year. It went to seven feet. So we had this, you know, we had something like this. We had um, stakes. We had everything trying to control that tree. Unfortunately, it only produced about four or five tomatoes. we should be using. So now you've planted your, your tomato plant, you put the walls of water around it if you wanted to. Now what you want to use is tools. This is, and I think you saw some of this in the cover uh, presentation or cover. It's like a netting, like a veil almost. So once you plant your tomato plants, they're really prone to insect. So you either want to wrap your, your cages with it or you want to cover them. And Secure them, secure this netting with, you know, either rocks or you can use stakes to hold it down. But you really need to do that. I remember my first year in the garden, I thought, well, how are the bees going to get in to pollinate? And I saw a lot of bees stuck in there and I was trying to help get them out. And that's when I was educated by one of uh, the women in the garden who was a master gardener that tomato plants are self pollinating. So the way you can help in the pollinating is you just go around and you shake the plant. Just give it a little shake. So any of the pollen that's on the upper will fall to the lower or just cause it to kind of come in the air and hopefully, you know, pollinate those buds that are out there. And so it's okay if you see people doing that. They're okay. They're just trying to pollinate their tomato plants. But there's another type of uh, cloth you might want to do too because we're talking now about freezing temperatures. Now let's talk about when it gets hot. When it gets hot in summer, it can be scorching hot. Especially the west sun can really, you know, do some damage to tomato plants. So this is, is a shade cover that you could use. And you can, some people cover the entire plant and some people just do the west side. You figure out what you need. 
And you can look too, because one year I just had to do the west, I think it was west side, because a neighbor uh, in the garden, you know, what they were planning gave me a lot of shade in the garden. So I was just covering and, and really watching the left side of the, when my plants were left side of the garden, dealing with shade. And um, talking about which side of the garden, First year, I started on the west side. Last year, I was on the east side. This year, I will be on the west side. So that's what you need to do. There are crops that you rotate. Don't just keep, keep uh, planting them in the same beds year after year. Just rotate them. So uh, next up, we'll be setting up the water uh, water system. about the tomato plant's watering system. Here you can see the yellow automatic watering line comes in um, and attached to it is the four foot hose that goes directly to the manifold. What I've set up, and I see many of the gardeners use a drip system. This is a half inch tube with an emitter. And so that's what I've set up and all the way down the line, each, you know, about every 24 feet. Uh, 24 feet would be a rather large garden. Every 24 inches, you will see a uh, tomato plant. So with this set up, I want to make sure with this type of system, tomatoes need water that is um, deep, that goes deep and slow. And so this type of system can do that. I've got a four gallon per hour emitter on this line. And if times for 15-20 minutes uh, you get the automatic watering that'll give you about a gallon and especially in the beginning stages when you just planted the tomato plants you need to make sure that you get enough water so even if it's watered three days a week you might have to come in and just add to it but you want those those roots they, they go very deep I mean I remember once pulling out uh, a root on a, on a tomato plant and it was about that long. I mean, they really, they develop long roots and that's what you want. So you set this up and then on the, uh, you've got the basin around it. Remember you want your basin. And I don't know if you've noticed, but what I've done is just, I added more dirt to here because when I got down here to look at this from a different perspective, I noticed I didn't put enough dirt around it. I needed it to go up further on that stem so that's what i've done so this is a better you know view of what your plant should look like when you plant it remember i took off those bottom uh, uh, leaves so you've got the basin around it now if you want to know well, do i have enough water do i need water i have a water meter and the garden has a water meter you could use and it shows it's either dry moist or wet so just insert it in many people just kind of stick their finger in just to tell and you, and usually I test in the evenings I don't test in the morning I test in the evenings when it's had the whole day to be outside to see if it really needs watering if you are going to water make sure when you're watering don't do this don't water the foliage I made that mistake my first year and I scorched most of the tomato plants if I was watering the evening and I did that and it wasn't good Water around, you know, have it on a, you know, don't have it bursting out. Have it low, at a low pressure, and just, just water around. And these type of wands work well for that. So next thing that we're going to talk about, now that we've um, covered the water systems, the next thing that we're going to talk about is plant maintenance. So we'll go back to the presentation. All right. Well, Sandra, thank you very much. That's all right. Um, okay, so if you wish, you can go to your next slide. Um, uh, let's see. Microsoft PowerPoint. Here we go.
Okay, hang on just a sec, Chris. Oh, next one, sorry. There we go. Whew. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks, Sandy, for that. And we apologize for the, the bad uh, uh, volume there. It's, uh, it's really tricky out of the garden in the springtime. There's so much wind, but uh, Sandy did a, did a good job there. And people put so questions uh, into the chat box. And so please, if there's anything you didn't catch and you wanted to know what Jane was sharing, a, Sandra was talking about, put in that chat box in the Q&A and we'll come back to it. Sorry for the, for the uh, interruption. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no problem at all. Uh, now, regarding maintenance, first of all, let's talk a little bit about mulching. And mulching is important because it does provide a protective layer between the plants and any potential disease that comes from the soil. And it also uh, keeps the water in the soil from evaporating in our hot summer climate and keeps the, water, uh, the soil cooler in our hot weather as well. We usually use uh, composted mulch uh, around our plants in our garden. Um, but I will refer you to other classes on mulching and its benefits, um, as we will uh, not use that time, the time today to talk about that. The one that Susan Miller Hoover did on the 18th of February in the Starcher Garden class, she does discuss mulch, as does Dan McEwen, who did his class on from seed to table on the 25th of uh, February. And in a couple of weeks today, from today, Jennifer Boltz will be teaching a class on mulching and microbes. So uh, you will get mu much more information uh, from all of those classes. But definitely do mulch your tomatoes right in the bottom of that basin that Sandy built from the video. Now regarding fertilizing, once your tomatoes have been planted and have had Glenn's Mix fertilizer added at that time, let me also insert that um, the Glenn's mix uh, that Glenn uh, from Plant Fair recommends, there is a handout sheet in the shack there at the Payson Community Garden. And I also believe that Dan in his class in March uh, was on the 18th. Uh, he gives the details on how to make that fertilizer that we call Glenn's Magic Mix. I did see a question in there. Um, it does consist of blood meal, bone meal, potash, and then a general uh, garden tomato and herb fertilizer that is sold at Plant Fair. And Chris, I think um, that in one of the other classes, uh, you did put out um, the actual measurements for that. Um, but it is a handout in the, uh, in the shack that you, can, that you can access. So once we've added the fertilizer when we plant, we usually wait until the uh, plant has set any fruit before fertilizing again. Just add a light amount of fertilizer every couple of weeks uh, until the first frost. You should work it down into the soil underneath. Uh, don't get it on the uh, foliage at all. Water it in really well. And be careful not to over fertilize too early in the plant's life as that can lead to tall spindly specimens that have lots of green foliage, but very few flowers that will lead to less fruit on your tomatoes. Um, okay, now, Let's go on to talk about pruning. I'm going to go to the next slide. Now, as Sandy mentioned when she planted, um, let's talk a little bit about the suckers that occur right between the, uh, the branches and the main stem. First of all, why do you need to prune? It improves the airflow because you will have fewer leaves and will make your plant less disease susceptible because the leaves that you do have will dry faster after rain or any accidental watering. It's much easier also to spot insects that can hide in the thick canopy of leaves. And if you prune at the correct time, the energy of the plant will not go into producing leaves, it will go into producing fruit and especially larger fruit. And when we have tomatoes, that's really what we want. So let's go to the how. Now the suckers, as you can see on the left-hand side, is the small stem that occurs between the main stem and any branches. Nip those that are underneath the first cluster of fruit by hand or carefully snip off with uh, very delicate snippers. And make sure you trim any leaves once the plant starts to grow a little bit, as you can see on the right. Trim the leaves off the ground at least six to 12 inches. And that'll also help keep any soil disease away from the plant when you happen to water. 
If you water too uh, vigorously, you'll get splashing and any microbes or any disease that might be in your soil can get onto the branches and the leaves. And you certainly don't want that. Make sure too that you prune off any dead leaves, especially towards the end of the plant's life. Try and make sure it's kept really clean underneath the plant. And one other note, determinate varieties do not need to be pruned as they are more of a bush tomato. Um, and towards the end of the growing season, uh, as fall comes towards, as we get towards fall, the indeterminates can be pruned of their new growth so that all the energy of the plant will grow towards fruit development and will ripen and not leaf production. Now let's talk about insects and disease. And I will refer you to the recent class uh, that was excellent taught by Susan Miller Hoover on bugs on April 1st for more in-depth information. But these are a couple of insects I want you to watch out for. In the top row, you see the tomato hornworm. And if this is undetected, it will gobble up your tomato and its leaves really fast. These are the pictures of the worms on the left and the moth on the right that it comes from. As you can see, they're very, very well camouflaged and difficult to detect. So really stay alert and inspect your tomato plants often, especially as the tomatoes start to ripen. They hide on the underside of leaves and they also will grow, grow. they will glow green under a black light. And last season, the garden held a hornworm blacklight party at the garden at night to spot and remove these devastating pests. Fortunately, we didn't find that many, which is a real testament uh, to the diligence of our gardeners. Now on the bottom row, you'll see the beet leafhopper bug that can land on your tomato plants and infect it with this curly leaf virus that you can see on the right. The leaves will turn curly and look wilted, but they won't respond to any more water. The veining underneath will appear purple. And we had some of these in our garden last year. Sadly, it completely destroys the plant and you must pull the whole thing out. Make sure you cover it with a garbage bag before you pull it out to prevent the spread of infection into your other plants. And do throw it into the dumpster. Do not throw it on the compost pile. Most hybrid tomatoes are more disease resistant, which is good. We want you to refer to any of our garden staff for any other diseases or questions you might have and their possible remedies. But these are the two main issues with tomatoes uh, that you must be vigilant against. Now, here is an example of what we did with the tool fabric wrapping or draping over our tomatoes. We had nine tomatoes last year. And instead of wrapping each one of these cages individually, what we did is decide to uh, put up large stakes and we draped uh, the tool over the top of everything. And this gave the tomatoes much more room to grow because if you tend to wrap the tool to protect from any insects around too tightly, it can really strangle your plant. So this gave our tomatoes uh, a lot of uh, room to grow and protected them from uh, the insects. And as you can see here in the photo, uh, you can see the marigolds and the basil that we grew as well. And uh, not only did it add some visual interest, but uh, hey, we had instant caprese salad uh, with the basil. So we were really uh, happy with that. Um, what we did, we secured it with some rocks and also uh, some um, stakes, but it allowed this, we felt allowed for easy access. So we could weed underneath, we could prune and we could easily harvest it. Um, if you do need to use any pesticides, make sure you check with a staff member uh, or with Glenn at Plant Fair before you purchase one as it must be OMRI, O-M-R-I listed. It must be organic because we are organic uh, at the garden. And the best way really to uh, maintain your garden plot is visit the community garden often to check your plot. Like I said, we were there on most days and we loved to be in our garden. It was our happy place. And we made so many wonderful new friends. Um, keep your garden clean, pull up any dead leaves or weeds to prevent disease and keep everything off the ground. And that will help keep your garden and your neighbor's garden uh, free of pests as well. Now let's go on and talk about harvesting. How do you know, first of all, when your tomatoes are ripe? Well, 
in one instance, let's talk about cherry tomatoes. They'll reach full color on the plant. So just try one and see if it's right. And we love growing these because these are a wonderful, great, sweet garden snack. You should keep and refer to the tag on the plant when you purchase it. And that will show what the tomato will look like when it is ripe and the length of time from planting to maturity. And not all tomatoes will turn red. As you can see, like this gold medal heirloom tomato that we grew last year. So this will give you a good idea what to look for on the tag and how long you can expect it to take really from planting to ripening. Now tomatoes are an interesting plant. They do emit a gas. Ethylene gas is produced by fully mature, fully formed mature green tomatoes. And therefore those can be picked before completely ripened and stored indoors uh, where they will continue to full ripeness. You can put them on a windowsill like we did but nothing eats, nothing eats, nothing eats better than a fully ripened vine tomato and nothing beats it either. So a week or so after your tomatoes start to ripen, suddenly you're harvesting a lot of tomatoes. Please don't forget donations to the food banks. Uh, hang on a sec. Please don't forget donation to the food banks during this time. And they love to see all the delicious vegetables donated during the summer, but especially tomatoes. And the Payson Community Garden would like each gardener to donate at least 20% of their crops. Let me go back. Sorry, I'm gonna go back a little bit here. At least 20% of their crops to the food banks. Harvest days are Mondays and Thursdays, and we can always do with volunteers to help with the harvest. Also, you will find that you're suddenly becoming a cherished friend amongst some of your neighbors. There are lots of great ways to enjoy your tomatoes like BLTs, making fresh salsa or in salads, such as this caprese salad that we made last year. They're great to share. And that's also a great way to recruit new neighbors to the garden for next year. Now, because we did plant rather late last year, we had a lot of green tomatoes that weren't going to ripen because of the cooling fall temperatures. We got a great hint from fellow gardeners on how to ripen green tomatoes. Just put them in a, a paper grocery bag, staple it closed and put it in a dark closet. Give it several days and you'll be surprised to open it and see which tomatoes have ripened. Or you could just fry them in cornmeal for a great fried green tomato sandwich. Now tomatoes are very versatile as well. You could freeze, can or dehydrate them for future use. We actually bought a dehydrator and tried our luck with tomatoes. They turned out great and we use them still on homemade pizza. We also froze some and stored them in vacuum sealed bags for the winter as well. So we later thawed them and made some marinara sauce as well as fresh salsa. So this is a picture of our wonderful green, uh, pink brandy wine tomato. So I hope that you've enjoyed our Tomatoes Galore presentation. So to close in the spirit of that great Australian crocodile Dundee, now that's a tomato. Also, I wanna make sure that uh, you all know the May hours for the garden uh, are going to be Monday to Friday, eight to 11 a.m. and three to 6 p.m. And then on Saturday uh, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Well, thank you very much. Okay, now I've got to try right. and figure out our, uh, well, our video. I can, Here we go. I can bring this down and you just bring your camera back up. And thank you, Here everybody. We We've had about 50 people with us today, Jane and Sandra. I really enjoyed the video. And um, we are going to take questions for the next 10 or 12 minutes. I'll shut down the video so that we have the, something consumable for the, for the website for YouTube. But then if you have more questions, and as long as Jane and, and Sandra are willing to stick around, we're going to answer your questions and just get off to lunch a little late. Sound okay? Sounds good. <laughs> All right. So let's get into our uh, Q&A here. And one of the first questions, okay, we're back to that. You, you mentioned that fertilizer formula. formula. And I was just looking for Glenn's Magic at his website and at uh, Payson One, and I wasn't able to find it. But that's particularly, it's described in, 
Everett, I'll find which which of those videos that it, that it's described in. And I know there's one that uh, that uh, yeah, it was uh, it was done by Dan. Yeah, Dan um, McEwen. McEwen did. On, uh, the 18th of March. Yeah. So, so Everett, if you're able to go to my web to the YouTube playlist and watch Dan McEwen's presentation from the 18th of March, he gives that details on how to make it. Um, another question is, what was the duration and frequency of the watering you were doing with a four gallon uh, hour emitter? I know that three times a week, is it Monday, uh, Thursday, Saturday. Saturday is the watering. And it usually went for 15 to 20 minutes. So at 15 minutes with a four gallon emitter, that would give you about a gallon. Very good. If I did my math correctly. And how do you prevent blossom end rot? There's a great question. Ooh. We have not come across blossom end rot. I know I have read about it. Um, I may have to refer that one to you, Chris, because you are the horticultural expert. Um, but we, I don't think we, we get it as much because it's not a very humid uh, climate, but I will defer to you on that one. Well, the way you avoid it is by gardening the way Jan and Sandra do, because Jane and Sandra do, because if they don't have it, they're doing all the right things. <laughs> using, <laughs> using, um, uh, using resistant plants is good too. They're using some of these hybrids that are, that are good, good plants for doing this. Like they said, the big boy, as opposed to um, the beef steak or something like that. But blossom end rot comes from a lack of calcium. It gets bound up in the soil and it's not able to get into the, the fruit itself. Mm -hmm. And the way that we are able to achieve, to limit that in our gardens in Arizona is by maintaining even moisture. And so when you really get that is when the feeder roots dry out and by osmosis, they bring in all that material from the, from the soil and you end up with the blossom end rot. So it really has to do with our pH and the soil and you prevent it by, with the soil moisture. So, Chris, does, um, does adding uh, different uh, calcium supplements, you know, we added like azomite and, and different supplements, uh, you know, crab shell, things like that at the end of the season that can be kind of worked into the soil, um, you know, and rested over the winter. Does that make a difference in, in the blossom end rot? I, can, I believe it can help. Um, and, and other places than Payson, calcium carbonates are present, present and calcium is not a limiting factor. It has more to do with that pH and, moist, and moisture regime mm -hmm. in, in that we get it. Romas are really notorious for blossom end rot. So that's another tough one to grow. And you didn't have that on your list. I noticed that because it's a little yeah, tough. No, to we, haven't, uh, we haven't grown Romas. Uh, you know, we don't make that much marinara sauce and Romas, you know, being a determinant, they tend, you get a whole load of them all at once. And, and it's not really something that we particularly, you know, specialize in. But that, that's a good, and, and then yeah. one more thing for managing your soil moisture, mulch. And yeah. Dane went over that mulch. And so that way that'll hold the moisture in the ground and keep it from fluctuating and help prevent blossom and rot. Gara's asking, do you recommend growing in five gallon buckets? Ooh. I would, uh, I know some people who have, have done that and they're now in the garden because it, you really want to develop a good root system. So I think it's best to, to, to plant in good soil. It gives those roots a lot of room, unless you have a type of tomato that, um, you know, it's gonna be small, like a patio tomato possibly, but it would be very difficult. We've actually tried to um, plant some of our plants that were kind of left over that we didn't plant in the garden. We did those in, in, the, in the buckets and they just didn't make it. Yeah. And it's hard to support them too, to get a trellis in there. So, so that's why we would uh, always recommend trying to use a garden if it's available. Right, so Gar, I'd say 
grow a tomato where you can. And if a five gallon bucket is what you've got, it's what you got. Um, yeah. I, I would think that a large terracotta type of um, pot might be better. The, the struggles you run into is just as they were describing, tomatoes need lots of soil and lots of nutrients to be able to grow and do their things. So you've got to be regularly feeding a tomato and you already heard they feed their, their plants a lot in, in pacing. So you have to regularly feed it if you're going to grow it in a small container like that and they dry out quickly too. So you have to watch, you have to be irrigating it every day. So well, and as yeah. I mentioned before, we pulled out root systems that were two to three feet long, oh, even more. And that's that's what you want to develop is a really good root system. Another thing that you would do is look for one that just kind of has a short um, harvest season. And yeah, just mm -hmm. like you're describing, just try to try to look into it. There's a lot of a lot of people grow them in buckets. So you can certainly do so. Um, OK, Rachel is asking or Raquel, what? Were any of the tomatoes you discussed determinate or just semi-determinate? What do you? The, uh, the, the first three were the first three were determinate. Um, I know uh, beefsteak uh, is as well as um, a big boy. Hang on, I'm just getting my getting my list here. Um, beefsteak is indeterminate. Big boy, the lemon boy, and also the yellow pear cherry is an indeterminate cherry. Um, the Celebrity and the Somerset that we recommended were kind of sort of in between. Um, they grew, they didn't grow as tall as the other ones, and, uh, but they, they still gave a really heavy load of tomatoes. When I looked them up, I thought both of those last two were determinate, but it seemed like they called them semi-determinate. So I'm not sure, Chris, really, maybe they, they're kind of in between. Um, but they still put out a heavy, heavy load of tomatoes that ripen closer together than, say, a big boy, which will extend really, you know, from, you know, the first, the first crop right through uh, until the fall. Good. Um, I have a couple of questions. One says, and, and I'm going to handle this one, when would you plant mm -hmm. a Yuma? And then I have another saying they're down in Kearney. Um, I am going to put a publication, a link to a publication in the chat box. It's the uh, 10 Steps to a Successful Garden in Arizona. It has planting seasons and information on that. So, um, but, but Susan asks, how, how often do you put fertilizer on tomatoes? And I think just going back over that fertilizing may help those questions as I go to um, sure. find that information. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, what we usually do is fertilize. Don't fertilize when the plant is really young, once you've already planted it. We put a little fertilizer in the bottom as Sandy did, then a little on the top, work it in, water it in real good. Then wait for it to start to set its fruit. Then another light mix of fertilizer every couple of weeks. And make sure you water it, um, you work it down into the soil um, you know, don't just leave it on top, kind of work it down as much as you can and give it good water so it dissolves and will really feed the plant throughout uh, its life. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying to answer this oh, that's okay. question here. We're looking at your computer screen and yeah. we're watching you look at it. So what I'm saying is this, the, the, I'm putting in a publication in the chat box just saying this pub has when to plant charts, you know, so, so oh, this will help um, Susan and Ruth and everybody, which we call our 10 Steps Successful Vegetable Garden, um, popular uh, extension publication that we've had for, for several years, but included on that are the charts about at what elevation and when to plant. And um, down in Yuma, I understand you're growing tomatoes through the winter now. You're planting in the fall and you're able to have tomatoes in, in you know, for Christmas. So <laughs> it's gotten pretty warm. Phoenix works too. So Gar has just put in, what is the minimum amount of direct sunlight? Well, I know, well, I really don't know the minimum. I think what we worry about more is to have to shade them as the summer really sets in. 
especially in the garden from the west. Uh, that's why I talked about the shade cloth. You, there's a very good possibility with as, as, as intense as the summers have been in Payson in the last few years, that you might need shade cloth. I don't know about a minimum. I know they, they like the sun and the ideal temperature is 70 to 80. Um, but when it really gets into, you know, the 80s and or the 90s, the 90s quite a bit, yeah. and you're going to have to put some shade cloth over them to avoid them from getting scorched. I don't, have I answered the question? I know I couldn't answer what the minimum amount of sun is, but, but they do love the sun. But they love the sun, yeah. Um, you know, I understand that you want them to be getting at least eight hours of sun a day. Um, our sun's so intense that we can often get by with a little bit less. It gets reflected and so on. So we often sun is not usually our limiting factor in Arizona. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, that makes it. But but some people have shady places. So if they got them in some cloud in some trees and so on, you know, it may not be enough light. And so you do want to make sure you're getting that about eight hours of sunshine. I am going to bring this presentation to a close. We can still continue our discussion. I'm putting in the chat box right now, the uh, link for the survey. So if you fill out that and do that evaluation for me, I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> and here is Jane and Sandra, yay. Thank you very much for your presentation today. Thank you. Uh, we've just been doing our Q&A and our discussion with Jane and Sandra, thank you. And just to let people know that next week when we come back, that's Earth Day, isn't it? I've got my colleague, Ashley Hollinger. She's a research analyst at the UA Water Resources Research Center. And she's gonna be talking about transforming needs into assets, establishing a watershed partnership to address environmental and economic challenges. We have a watershed partnership down in the Globe Miami area we call the Cobra Valley Watershed Partnership. And so we're looking at it in ways for the cities and the mines to be able to um, work together and, and so anyway, just the work we've been doing and talking about that, that's what's going on next week. So thank you everybody for your time today and we'll see you next time. Have a great day.